Welcome this evening. Um, so this is our Universe Reveal lecture series. This is our fifth talk this fall. Um, and this is a series that was started by Jonathan Crass, who is in the audience tonight. And it was started at uh, the University of Notre Dame, included first physics and, um, and astronomy. And then this year, we've broadened to all fields of science and also University of Notre Dame, as well as Indiana University, South Bend. My name is Deb Marr. I'm in the Department of Biology at Indiana University, South Bend. Um, and just a, a little bit of a preview. Actually, I'll come back to this one. Um, in December, uh, we will have Nancy Michael and Velshona Lukey, uh, and they will be talking about how neurobiology connects with trauma and thinking about human resilience. So it should be a really interesting talk. Um, and uh, so that's coming up. And then also December 2nd, uh, Jordan Ellenberg, who's a mathematician at the University of Wisconsin, um, will be giving a talk at Jordan Hall of Science, which is on the Notre Dame campus. Uh, he just recently published a book on shape, uh, the hidden geometry of information. Um, and so uh, that is coming up. And uh, tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce Elon Levine. He's a professor of physics at Indiana University, South Bend. He uh, did his bachelor's degree at Yale University, his uh, master's and doctorate degrees at Purdue University. And he's been working with a number of high school students, undergraduates, as well as international collaborator, col uh, collaborators from a number of countries, including uh, Canada, Spain, Mexico, India, uh, the Czech Republic, um, and a number of universities within the US. So tonight, he's going to be talking about his work on dark matter. And with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Elon. And there Thanks, you go. Deb. OK, can everybody hear me? Sounds like it. OK, great. Um, I am very used to, and I think it's most productive, especially since we're a pretty small group, uh, if I say something that you don't understand, just raise your hand and let me clarify so that you're not trying to figure stuff out as I've gone ahead. So please don't hesitate. <clears throat> um, so first of all, thank you for coming. And uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to talk about what I think is one of the most interesting problems uh, in physics and astronomy. And that's the nature uh, of the dark matter. Um, I'll start off with uh, an introduction about uh, why we believe the case for the existence of dark matter uh, is so strong, uh, and uh, then talk a little bit about the speculation as to the nature uh, uh, of the particles of dark matter. Uh, I'll cover a little bit, whoops, a little bit about. Uh, uh, how various types of uh, physicists and astronomers are searching for this exotic material, for particles of it. And then I'll talk more specifically about how uh, the IUSB team with its international collaborators uh, is conducting uh, their search uh, or searches. Um, and I'll give a little update as to what's going on right now in our laboratories. Um, okay. So I always like to start with an acknowledgement of my uh, colleagues. I often run out of time at the end, so that should be this should go first. I've worked, been blessed to work with a bunch of great uh, undergraduates, uh, high school teachers, high school students, uh, a postdoc, and an engineer who has done work with me for many years uh, on uh, the dark matter uh, search experiments and also colleagues at ISO, so, and for instance, in the chemistry department. Um, you can see some of the students, um, not all physics majors, not, not even all science majors, but one of them are, um, who have gone on to do different things. Um, and uh, so our most, uh, oops, our most, our, our current, uh, Experimenters in the lab are shown here. I have a, a high school uh, science teacher from Rise Up Academy, uh, uh, a recently graduated physics major, uh, um, 
Lexi is a, a high school student at Marion, University, uh, Marion High School. And uh, uh, David uh, is a general studies major who has suddenly uh, found he wants to go to grad school in environmental sciences. Um, okay, so that's, that's who is doing this, along with international collaborators on the PICO experiment. I'll talk a bit more about that later. And as you can see, we have collaborators from uh, around the world, mostly Canada and the United States. Uh, but as Deb alluded to, we have collaborators from India and uh, uh, Mexico. Um, and also on another dark matter search experiment that we're conducting, similar in nature but different in the details, the scintillating bubble chamber collaboration with, uh, again, uh, experimenters from mainly North America. OK, let, let's start with uh, uh, certain things that we know classically. Uh, we know, since the time of Newton, about how things fall near the surface of the Earth, like apples, whoops, falling from trees. And I'm trying to, there. I'm, I'm going in the wrong direction. There we go. I'll get used to this by the end of the talk. Um, so we know from Newton's laws uh, of motion and gravity uh, how things like uh, uh, apples fall near the surface of the Earth. Uh, and we know how things move and are changed in their motion uh, by uh, forces on them. We also know uh, about the force of gravity. And uh, we can put these together um, to understand things like how a cloud of gas uh, at the edge of a spiral galaxy, which is a large system which is spinning around, uh, we can tell how much force is required to keep it in orbit around this mass as a function of its distance. We can put this information together into this relation, which is one of the big, two big relations that we'll talk about tonight, um, which is the speed of this object orbiting this mass uh, at a distance r from the center of that mass. Um, OK. We can actually invert this relationship. And if we measure the speed, if we measure the speed of the orbit, and the distance from the center, we can infer how much mass this system has. We also know how systems such as stars, galaxies, and clusters of galaxies work, by which I mean we know, uh, given the amount of mass that a star has, how much light it will put out. Or we can turn that around. If we measure the amount of light coming from that star, we can infer how many atoms that star is made out of. Likewise, for larger systems like galaxies and clusters of galaxies, if we, if we measure the amount of light coming from a galaxy cluster, we can tell how many atoms are in that galaxy cluster. There's a lot of detail that has to, uh, you have to go into to get that number, but it is possible to do that. And likewise, uh, if we measure the amount of light there, we can say how much mass in the form of atoms that system has. Oops. So in, in, starting in the 1930s, Fritz Zwicky was studying uh, a particular cluster, the Coma Cluster of Galaxies. And he measured the amount of light coming from this cluster, which has thousands of galaxies in it. All of these things here, these are all galaxies. There are several thousand galaxies in this cluster. So he measured the light coming from this cluster and inferred what the mass of the cluster must be to make that much light. But he also measured the speeds of these galaxies in the cluster and inferred how much mass is necessary in order to bind such a, uh, a gravitating system. And the problem was, that the answers that he came out with were inconsistent. You need about 10 times more mass to hold that system together than you would estimate from the light coming from the system. Um, okay. 
it took time for physicists and astronomers to, uh, uh, to really get on board with how big of a problem this was. It wasn't really until 1970 when Vera Rubin and Kent Ford started measuring uh, the rotation curves of spiral galaxies. So what is that? They were studying spiral galaxies, which are large galaxies that spin around. And you can measure how fast the bits are spinning around as a function of distance by using something called the Doppler shift. Um, and so if you look at that spinning system, you can say, OK, how much mass is needed to hold that system together? But you can also measure the light coming from the galaxy. And remember, I said that uh, uh, you can tell how much uh, 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 mass the system has in the form of atoms from the amount of light coming from the system. And the thing is, again, there was, these results were inconsistent. Um, this is a bit of a complicated plot. We, you don't have to uh, know all of the details, but you should at least see the plot to get a feeling for it. So this is a plot here of their results of um, the speed of orbit of bits of a spiral galaxy as a function of how far away those bits are from the center. So in other words, uh, this, the stuff that's over here might have speeds that are like this. The, speed, the, the, the bits that are over here might have a speed that's like this. And the bits out here on what looks like the edges have a speed that looks like that. Why is that a problem? Well, remember, Newton's laws of motion and gravitation tell us what the rotation speeds should look like as a function of distance from the center. And they should look something like this. That's, that's this expression here. But what's observed are the points with the error bars. And there's two big puzzles here. One, the observed speeds are too high. And Two, the functional form is wrong. The speeds are not dropping. It's not like we just missed some stuff and there's just a scaling. Even the functional form is wrong. It should be dropping as 1 over the square root of the distance from the center, but it's not. It's sort of flat. A way to understand that would be is if this, what looks like the entire galaxy, is really embedded in a halo a spherically symmetric uh, distribution of mass that we just don't see. And the amount of extra speed that you would need from that would look something like this in order to take what we expect, and we have to add to it this to get reality, which is this. OK. Any questions so far? Yes. Your result in red right there was the spin method identifies 10 times more mass no, no. The, the, the light method predicted that there's a lot less mass. Okay. okay. The spin method tells us there's a lot more mass there that's holding that fast spinning object together. According to our measurements of the spin, it says you need x amount of mass. If you take the amount of light that's coming from the system, it says there's one tenth that amount of mass in the form of atoms. So both methods are coming up with the same No, they're different, and that's the key point. Uh, so getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, maybe there's a kind of mass that's out there that's not in the form of atoms and does not create light. The assumption that all the mass that creates light is all there is, is wrong. Does that help? No, you can think of it as a spheric, uh, like a ball, it and it's and, uh, like a a ball with stuff throughout the ball. Okay. It's, not a shell, it? it's not a shell. Dark matter is going through you right now. Okay. Duck. Anything else before we go on? Yes. It seems to me a lot of the information you rely on from stuff is way, way away. Our, what we rely on is really 
Um, well, we have a, a large region of space near us where we can use Cepheid variable stars or even more so RR Lyrae variable stars. And we can compare our understanding of how they brighten and dim and what their luminosity is. We can com compare that to uh, another method called the method of parallax, which you can do right here in this laboratory by doing this and telling how far away something is. And so there's a, a pretty big region of space where we can use these two methods and, uh, uh, and, and calibrate the Cepheid variable technique against that. In fact, uh, Henrietta Leavitt did exactly that. And that's how she was able to do things like help discover where the center of the Milky Way galaxy is. I won't really be talking about that. But um, by using a plot of the distribution of Cepheid variable star can, stars in things called globular clusters, you can find out where the center of mass of the Milky Way galaxy is. If we look, in the if we look where that is, again, I won't be talking about this, but there's a, an enormous black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy with a mass that's over 4 million suns worth of mass. Uh, so this, the, the Cepheid variable technique for mapping out distances to things is pretty well founded. Anything else? There is a, a wide array of astronomical evidence for the existence of dark matter. We don't have time to go over all of them, but I should at least show you a, a few of them uh, just at a, a low level, just so that you get the sense that there are many different measures that tell us uh, um, that dark matter exists, since it is a very extraordinary claim. So one example comes uh, from uh, the uh, light that comes from uh, 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 objects that are far away, but whose light passes near uh, uh, galaxy clusters. And Einstein's general theory of relativity tells us uh, that uh, uh, a large amount of mass changes the geometry of space-time and causes light that's moving through that space-time to get bent. And with the proper arrangement of objects and galaxy cluster and observer, you can actually get the space around a galaxy cluster to act like a lens to see these very distant objects. And furthermore, you can actually infer from the light coming from this, these distant objects, you can infer how much mass, which causes how much curvature, you can infer how much mass is there. Um, and again, the amount of light that you measure coming from the galaxy cluster also tells you how many atoms there are. And again, the total amount of mass is way bigger than the amount indicated by the amount of light coming from the system. Also, here is a picture of a traffic accident from about 700 million years ago, where two galaxy clusters pass through each other. Complicated image from three different telescopes. Uh, what's shown in pink are X-ray emitting gases. In visible light, you can see the galaxies in each of the galaxy clusters. And in blue is a mapping, an indication of how much of this lensing is going on. Uh, of to, the, to background objects. And so the blue tells us where most of the mass of the two systems is. And what you can see is that the galaxies and most of the mass have passed through the collision, and the atoms, which is the intercluster gases, have been slowed down. They're separated from them. And so this is telling us that most of the mass is not in the form of atoms. Um, in fact, I don't know how we're doing for time, but. Um, there are other pieces of evidence, like looking at the early universe, seeing structures that shouldn't have developed. This is uh, one of the deep field views uh, of the universe from uh, 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 less than a billion years after the Big Bang. And you can see that things like condensed systems like galaxies have already formed. And I'll be happy to provide uh, anybody with uh, copies of the transparencies if they want them afterwards. Uh, so you don't have to take pictures of everything. You can if you want to. But. Um, and the thing is that these structures should not have had time to form since the Big Bang if all there was in the universe uh, uh, were atoms. 
You need something else to have condensed and formed wells of gravity into which atoms fell and formed these condensed systems. And likewise, the light from uh, 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 several hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, if we, if we look at the universe, the, 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 the temperature variation and density variation, the universe is far clumpier than it should have been at about a billionth of a second after the Big Bang uh, than, uh, 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 than it would be if there were only atoms in the universe. I'm not trying to pretend that I've really explained this sufficiently for you to understand it. I'm just trying with this to show that there's various forms of evidence uh, for, for these extraordinary claims shown here. This is a picture of the energy density uh, of the universe. Now, three quarters of it uh, is something uh, called dark energy. I, I won't be discussing that at all, but uh, uh, this is something what I find remarkable. We didn't even anticipate the existence of this stuff until 1998. Um, and it was found uh, by accident, including by one, of the, one professor from the University of Notre Dame, Peter Garnovich, who would be an excellent person for one of these talks, uh, uh, studying uh, type 1a supernovae. Um, the stuff that you and I are made out of and everything in this room and what is apparently out there Everything made out of atoms is indicated here in red. Um, and then what's shown here in blue is the rest of the mass that's in the universe. Um, this is about 90% of the mass of the universe is in the form of this exotic material. Um, so one question is, where would this dark matter have come from? Um, and it likely came from a... a uh, an epoch in the universe uh, when it was very dense, very hot, and here's the second equation that we'll be looking at tonight, uh, when uh, subatomic particles would smash into each other at great energies and convert via this expression, large amounts of energy could make high mass particles and conversely high mass particles colliding could annihilate and create energetically moving uh, other particles. Um, and so uh, uh, um, the simplest version of this story is that in the early, early universe, less than a fraction of a second after the Big Bang, um, the, the, the dark matter was in equilibrium with ordinary matter. Uh, ordinary matter and dark matter were getting created and annihilated. And then the universe cooled as it expanded. And so there wasn't enough, eventually when, when a gas cools, the, the particles of the gas slow down. Eventually, they don't have enough energy to make dark matter. Uh, and as the universe kept expanding, these dark matter particles started not to be able to find each other and annihilate. And so the amount of dark matter got frozen in, and that's the stuff that remains to this day. So if we discover this stuff, what we're seeing is the stuff that was created in about a billionth of a second after the Big Bang. I find very cool. So, <clears throat> um, in order for us to have never seen this stuff, um, they have to have uh, the, the, this dark matter has to have very very weird properties. It has to be intrinsically invisible. It's not just that it's not lit up; it's that it doesn't absorb or emit light. Um, it has to be all around us because we see it in terms of. Uh, uh, the uh, clumpiness of, of the universe. Uh, these particles would be going through us at orbital speeds, at pretty high speeds. And it, we haven't seen it, and so this stuff travels through thousands of light years of lead bricks without bouncing off of a single lead atom. Um, and yet it's only because this stuff exists that condensed systems like Stars, galaxies, stars, and us exist. And it may seem very strange to you that such a material can exist, but there are particles which have individually been seen, in, including by me in my previous work, uh, called neutrinos that are going through you all the time, from the sun, from the Big Bang, from supernovae. 
They're going through you and you never feel them because they interact only very weakly like these uh, 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 hypothesized dark matter particles. Any questions before we go on? Yeah? It, it is a fraction and was initially speculated maybe the dark matter is just a whole bunch of neutrinos. However, we know that the vast majority of the dark matter can't be in the form of neutrinos. The, if it were, the universe, as I showed you that picture uh, from uh, 380,000 years after the Big Bang, this cosmic microwave background radiation, that would have been a much smoother picture because neutrinos move at close to the speed of light. And so the universe would have been much more uniform in temperature and density. So um, the, uh, the dark matter has to be either some very heavy particle that was moving non-relativistically at very early ages of the universe, or it has to have been it's a different type of candidate, which was created uh, w moving at very slow speeds. Then we're saying dark matter is way slower than neutrinos. Yes, yes. Neutrinos uh, have a very, very, very small mass. So small we haven't actually measured the amount of mass. We have limits on it, but not the amount. Other questions? Well, what did I just do? Um, so how do scientists go about trying to, to guess what the nature of such a material is? And I, I think you can break it up into two classes of techniques. You, you look for natural candidates for the nature of dark matter and sort of ad hoc uh, 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 starting points. Natural uh, um, uh, candidates are things which are suggested by other known problems that we're trying to solve, which predict particles that have the properties that the dark matter has to have uh, if those are correct theories. And so here I, I've listed a couple of uh, ideas about like why, you know, trying to answer why gravity is so much weaker than the other forces, or why this, uh, we live in a matter-dominated universe rather than uh, a universe that was equal amounts of matter and antimatter. These things are being studied by theorists and tested by experimentalists uh, uh, that, produ that, that produce, as part of their uh, work, classes of particles which could serve as excellent dark matter candidates. So these are called natural because th they're not problems that come suggested by any of the astronomical evidence that I've told you about. There's another class of uh, guess as to the nature of dark matter that comes from saying, well, we've got all this astronomical evidence that dark matter exists. Um, what kind of thing can we imagine that could be like that? So um, uh, uh, one idea that's been uh, proposed is that there is some mechanism in the very early universe that created a bunch of smaller black holes. It doesn't come about from any theoretical underpinnings, uh, uh, but is an attempt to propose a, a viable candidate for the dark matter. And so these are being searched for as well. Um, okay. We're okay? Yes? It, well, um, I do not see why black holes would do that. Um, and uh, you have to look at what the size of the black holes is. Uh, and, and people are looking for these candidates. We know that they're not too big because of the structures that we see forming. Uh, they have to be fairly small because they're distributed, for instance, throughout the Milky Way galaxy, this dark matter, that's causing these rotation curves. And so we've looked for things like big black holes that would cause something called microlensing of more distant stars as they pass in front of the view. So we know that they're not too big. We also know that they're not too small because they would, start, they would be evaporating. Really small ones would be evaporating. And we see bunches of gamma rays uh, bursting from the, or coming in bursts from evaporation of very low mass black holes. So 
uh, astronomers and physicists are trying to you know, close the window on the uh, black hole candidates. Yeah. So we know it exists. Uh, where is it? Well, it's all around us. Um, what is its nature? Uh, we know it's everywhere. We've taken these various natural and ad hoc okay, I don't know if, these natural and ad hoc uh, um, uh, guesses as to uh, uh, its nature, and there are lots of different theory, theories about what the nature of the dark matter might be. Um, one favored class uh, comes from uh, these natural proposals uh, from other problems that all seem to suggest that there would, if, if, the, if any or all of these things are true, would uh, uh, suggest the existence of particles which only interacted via the weak nuclear force uh, at most. Uh, they'd be massive and they'd be particles. And these are relics, as we talked about, of the Big Bang. But the problem is that this wide variety of hypotheses as to the nature of dark matter leads to an enormous variety of potential properties of the dark matter. So here is a plot of the um, uh, uh, various uh, viable candidates for dark matter that uh, are shown here. And there's, this is a plot of essentially the effective size. OK, so both of these are dying. That's great. Um, the effective size of dark matter, the chance of dark matter scattering off of ordinary matter as a function uh, versus the mass of potential mass of dark matter particles. And you see that the effective size can v varies by a thousand trillion 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 parts. And the uh, effective mass is, you know, varies by a thousand trillion 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 parts. That's a wide range of possible properties. So how do you design a detector to look for that stuff? And maybe a way to think about it is if you have a garden and you know that there's critters attacking the garden, but you don't know their nature, um, you know, they could be burrowing, scurrying on the surface, or flying. How do you design a trap for them? You have to make guesses as to what the critter is and design traps for that type of critter and hope that you get lucky before your next crops are ruined. So there's no one type of detector that can explore all these possibilities. And so scientists have to take what they think are the best guesses and design their detectors for those particular kind of candidates. Um, so there are many approaches to trying to find dark matter. Um, so uh, one class of uh, searches involves looking at the center of our galaxy, uh, or the sun, or the Earth, um, for dark matter particles which clump wherever mass clumps. Um, and they, uh, they look uh, for dark matter particles which annihilate, when they occasionally do, creating high energy uh, and unique energy uh, gamma rays. And so there are Astronomers, for instance, who use X-ray or gamma ray, rather, telescopes uh, to search for gamma rays coming from the center of the Milky Way galaxy, uh, as an example. Um, other kinds of scientists, uh, uh, like uh, our colleagues at the University of Notre Dame, uh, in the high energy group, search for dark matter particles, among other things, um, uh, that might be being made at the LHC. So in fact, uh, Dr. Mike Hildreth, spoke here a month ago, and he talked a little bit about the search for dark matter where the, the uh, colliding uh, proton beams may be actually making dark matter. And you look for it by looking for violations of things like conservation of momentum and energy. Yes? How quickly do you expect it to annihilate itself? And you have an expectation for that. Could you look to areas where you Well, if, if you're looking for uh, annihilations to gamma rays, 
then it has to be something that's fairly nearby, which means the center of our galaxy at, at, the, at the most distant. So it's stuff that's essentially annihilating now, not historically. I'm looking for gamma rays, I'm talking about a change in mass, indetectable dark matter mass, mass that's related to something other than that. Oh, the total amount of dark matter uh, that's been converted into gamma rays and thus the galaxy loses mass by the emission of that energy as gamma rays out, it, it's so low. You, that, that, so it's very low annihilation. Yes, yes. It, and if not, we would see it annihilating much more easily than we have so far. So, yeah. Uh, other questions? Um, OK, so th there, that's one way of searching for dark matter. And another way uh, is uh, the, the technique that my collaborators and I, as well as all of our competitors, are using is the so-called direct detection technique, where we look for dark matter that's actually passing through the Earth. And why we try to present to the dark matter targets of ordinary matter. So we won't actually see the dark matter particle itself. What we will see is a bunch of ordinary nuclei that scatter for no apparent reason. And then uh, uh, we, try to, we, we infer the existence of the dark matter which is causing these scatters. Um, the problem is that uh, the energy of these recoils is pretty small and the rate of these scatterings is very, very low. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been so hard to find already. So how do we see such a, uh, a slowly recoiling, whoops, a slowly recoiling uh, uh, nucleus? So we have our detector filled with atoms shown here in black. The dark matter particle comes in and then goes out, imparting some energy of motion and ionizing the nucleus. And uh, all of the experiments that I talked to you about differ in how they go from here. So we use this technique in order to uh, 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 search for dark matter. We prepare our atoms in the form of superheated liquids. These are liquids which are heated above their boiling temperature, um, but which if you keep them in a clean enough container and undisturbed, um, they can exist in that superheated state, like water above 100 degrees. Um, but not too high above. Um, they can exist in that state indefinitely. Um, so, but then if you disturb the liquid, you can cause an explosive phase transition from a liquid to a gas. And that can happen even with a very small disturbance. OK, so uh, an example of that. Whoops. Let's go back. Here is water heated in a microwave oven. Do not do this at home. This is heated above 100 degrees C. And he's, a penny was dropped in, and that water exploded. You can get terrible burns this way. I found this on the web. I would never do this. Do not do this. Um, but it illustrates the idea of how a tiny disturbance can be magnified into something we can see. So for us, it, we would have a an, a densely ionizing particle, a nucleus, that's depositing enough heat into a small enough region of space so that the pressure of a tiny bubble that gets created into existence here by this energy loss creates enough pressure that it exceeds the outside pressure plus the surface tension, which are trying to crush the bubble back down. That's the technique that we use. So uh, maybe less dangerously, here is that in a little test tube uh, bubble chamber. This is, by the way, this is a sequence. Uh, the entire sequence is one-tenth of a second. The superheated liquid has uh, been illuminated with a, a, a neutron source. And there's a single neutron that goes in there and hits a single nucleus. And everything that we see subsequently is from that single low-energy neutron hitting a single nucleus. It's been slowed down so you can see it. Because the, the liquid is superheated, this liquid 
grows without bound. And so we can allow this to get as big as we want so that we can register it with cameras and, it turns out, with acoustic transducers. I'll explain why in a moment. And of course, we never allow this to happen in our detector because, well, it would break our multi-million dollar detectors. Uh, and it would also, even if it didn't, it would take a very long time to settle the, uh, the experiment down uh, to, to wait and see the next candidate. OK, so what does it look like overall, a bubble chamber? That's what this type of detector is. How are we doing for time, by the way? Uh, OK, so it sort of looks like this. Here is the target fluid, uh, heated, superheated. Um, and uh, it's contained in a container that's meant to not allow spontaneous conversion into gas. Um, surrounding it is a hydraulic fluid so that the pressure, it's a passive system, so the pressure inside and the pressure outside never get too big, so our detector never breaks. We have cameras here observing the fluid, and we have acoustic transducers listening in. Um, because when these bubbles come into existence, they emit an audible uh, pop. Um, when the uh, uh, bubble is seen to come into existence, we have a pressure control unit, which slams the pressure on into the hydraulic fluid, which through a bellow system transmits that pressure into here and crushes a nascent bubble that gets about this big out of existence and back into the liquid state. And so then we allow it to settle down and get ready to, for, you know, to start observing again. Um, and the targets uh, uh, in our bubble chambers are different. We have liquid argon in the SBC uh, experiment and C3F8 or CF3I uh, in the PICO uh, bubble chamber experiments. Um, we have uh, 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 an optical and an acoustic sensing system. Um, one question might be, why do we do that? Well, here is uh, uh, an acoustic display of this type of event, where we have, say, three transducers on this detector, and uh, the uh, bubble pops into existence, and we can hear it acoustically. Why do we do that? It turns out that we discovered, again, accidentally in 2008, uh, during one of our earlier collaborations with superheated liquid, that we can actually hear the difference between the kind of bubbles that dark matter makes and the kind of bubbles that radioactivity makes. Radioactivity is our chief background, given where we do our experiments. And so you can sort of understand that from this plot here. This is a plot of the number of events, sorry, it's kind of dim, the number of events vertical, on the vertical axis and the loudness of the event on the horizontal axis. In this direction, we have louder and louder events. Now, these are two different types of uh, data runs. In one, shown in red, we were looking for dark matter. In the other, we were illuminating our detector with a neutron source. Neutrons will interact with the a superheated liquid in a way similar to how dark matter will interact. So the bubbles made by neutron interactions will sound like the bubbles made by dark matter interactions. And what you can see is that the radioactivity induced backgrounds are quite loud in comparison with the neutron induced events. In fact, we can even tell, th this is all from radon 222, and we can actually even tell which step in the radon decay chain we're observing here. This is a higher energy decay from uh, polonium-214 to, to lead-210, and it makes a louder sound. We can tell this from the timing of the events. Um, and uh, because of this, we are able to tolerate much higher levels of background than ordinarily we could have, about a 1,000 times more, at least. Uh, in, in theory, we could go up to about 100,000 times uh, as sensitive at a given level of radioactive contamination. Whoops. OK, well, I was going to show you what these two th here. 
This is sort of a, an amplified version of the two sounds from radioactivity. And we can plot that. That's what produces these plots here of loudness. Another thing is that our experiments have to be deep underground, like other direct detection experiments, because there's another kind of background we have to worry about, and that's the fact that uh, uh, our Earth is constantly bombarded by cosmic rays, which hit the upper atmosphere, create showers of subatomic particles, which, uh, if they went through our detector, uh, would cause signals like the dark matter cause. And so our experiments are all done over a mile underground in Snow Lab. Um, we also have to worry about uh, the radioactivity around us. Nearly everything on the Earth is pretty radioactive on our scale of things, not your scale of things. Like bananas are radioactive. Um, uh, but not in a way that would harm humans, but in a way that would harm our experiments. Uh, and so we have to try to make our detectors very clean in terms of radioactivity. And we also have to find ways to remove, uh, 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 per, you know, protect the detector from radioactivity that's in the environment. That's what I actually did uh, when I was working on the snow experiment. Um, our experiment is in northern Ontario, which has the deepest mine in North uh, America, the deepest active mine. It's a nickel copper mine. Um, and just to give you a sense of what it's like to do this type of work, you arrive and you go down to the lab with the miners. Uh, so you have to uh, you know, have a cage time of 6 a.m. Uh, in the winter, I remember my first winter there, the radio guy announced cheerfully it was going to warm up to minus 40 degrees. Um, by the time you get down uh, to where uh, our level is in the uh, uh, mine, the ambient temperature is plus 40 degrees C. Pretty hot, um, and from heat of formation of the Earth and radioactivity of the Earth, um, and it's also filthy. There's blasting going on. There's there's water sluicing everywhere. There's mud, and all of that stuff is highly radioactive. Dirt is really radioactive. Um, and inside uh, uh, a cavern here, uh, the uh, Snow Lab team has created one of the cleanest spaces in the universe uh, in terms of radioactivity. Um, here you see systems for the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory experiment. This was the heavy water purification system. And uh, this is a, a very early version of one of our uh, bubble chambers, a two liter uh, experiment. Um, OK, so get, to give you a sense of what's going on right now, well, no experiment has definitively detected individual particles of dark matter. There have been suggestions from one experiment there, there is uh, an annual modulation in their data which would be consistent with a dark matter signal, but no one's been able to confirm that signal, so we don't know what it is yet. Um, and uh, many of the simplest guesses as to the nature of dark matter have been tested by other experiments that would have caused those same signals, and they don't see it, so we don't know what's going on there yet. Um, a large amount of possibilities have been eliminated by the various types of dark matter experiments. Um, but we keep trying to make the detectors bigger and cleaner and more sensitive, right? The, uh, the, 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 the more exposure you have, the more atoms for the longer amount of time, the more chances you give for dark matter particles to hit uh, an atom of ordinary matter. And the cleaner you make the detector and the, the more sort of balanced you make the detector, the smaller the amount of energy that would, you would require to, to make a bubble, which would not be from contamination. And so we're, we're constantly working uh, on making our detectors bigger. Uh, right now, there's a, a, a 40 liter experiment uh, uh, running, and being, it's actually being upgraded now. And we're testing new design features because we've changed the way bubble chambers work in a number of radical ways. Um, and we're fabricating parts of and designing the rest of uh, a ton scale uh, detector with the C3F8 target. The uh, scintillating 
Bubble Chamber collaboration is a, a newer collaboration. Um, this is a, a, a target that is ideal for lower mass WIMP candidates, uh, dark matter candidates, than this experiment here. So these two experiments differ in terms of the types of candidates that they're testing. Um, and here you can see the PICO uh, 40 bubble chamber before it was filled. There, there's a lot of detail here. We won't go into it. But it, that, that liquid would be inside of here. It's all contained in it. First of all, there's an outer vessel that contains all of this. It has a hydraulic fluid out here that adjusts temperature and pressure. And then you have to put it inside of a large container of water to shield it from neutrons from uh, uh, radioactivity in the walls. Um, and here you can see, uh, for instance, uh, a single bubble event captured inside the chamber when it was running the first time. We're now refurbishing that detector. And the 500, uh, Pico 500 uh, chamber uh, uh, is Parts of it are completely built. Parts of it are still under design. For instance, at IOSB, we're looking at a new type of preamplifier to extend the capabilities uh, 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 of our acoustic transducers um, to be able to run in different modes that increase the uh, range of sensitivities and, and range of dark matter candidates that we can look for. Since, since other parts of the experiment are slowed down, we're taking advantage of that. Um, Oops, am I going the wrong direction? Yeah. There's also the uh, SBC uh, experiment, which uh, uh, right now we're uh, fabricating a 10 kilogram uh, bubble chamber. Um, I think, in the interest of time, I won't go through all the, uh, the details of it, of course. But inside, there is liquid argon. And we have uh, both light sensors that look for scintillation light and acoustic transducers, which look for um, uh, 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 the sounds inside of these, uh, uh, and also camera ports for looking at them. Oops. And here you can see a sort of cartoon of what the scintillating bubble chamber looks like on the inside. This is where the argon plus a, a dash of xen liquid xenon will be. And the acoustic sensors are down here, and uh, cameras and uh, 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 photomultipliers, certain kinds of very sensitive light sensors that can actually measure the energy of uh, the dark matter-induced events. Um, and here you can see what it looks like, not in a cartoon sense, but under construction. You can see we've constructed and tested parts of it, but we're finalizing uh, uh, that. So just to pull everything together, I hope, um, about 85% of the mass in the universe is in some exotic form. That means it's not in the form of atoms, but something else. We are all looking for individual bits of this stuff, but we really don't know what the nature of these bits is. And so we have lots of different ways of looking for it. Um, uh, IUSB is part of the PICO and SPC collaborations. And larger and more sensitive versions of these uh, chambers are coming on soon. But I do have to caution you, no one knows who's going to see dark matter particles first, or even if they're seeable at all. I've given you some optimistic cases. Could be that this stuff doesn't interact via the weak nuclear force either, maybe only gravitationally. And then, well, maybe no one will see them. But that's, you know, roll your dice and take your chances. Um, and then once dark matter particles are detected, if they are detected, there's still a lot more to do. We have to uh, try to understand what their nature is, not just prove that they're there, but what are they like? What's their mass? What's their spin, et cetera? Um, OK, those are my prepared remarks. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes? Is it possible to inadvertently pick up neutrinos with the bubble chambers? Uh, in fact, one of the strengths of the uh, uh, SBC uh, approach that we've started doing, well, a subset of us have started doing, is that they, you can run these detectors in modes where you're sensitive to neutrinos. And, and so this, this type of detector can, one, be sensitive all the way down to the so-called neutrino floor. There's 
there's certain irreducible backgrounds depending on what energy you're talking about, either from neutrinos that come from the sun or neutri uh, neutrinos that come from uh, ancient supernovae. Uh, and once, if, if the dark matter has properties that put it inside that soup, then we may never see them. But these detectors can see neutrinos. In fact, we're building two of these SBC bubble chambers, one for studying, uh, searching for dark matter, but the other thing that we're going to use this for is at a nuclear reactor uh, to study uh, the properties of neutrinos, looking at these things called sevens uh, neutrinos, which I, I don't know if you've ha had a talk about yet. But these are coherently interacting neutrinos that interact with an, uh, a nucleus as a whole um, and are useful for things like studying uh, the standard model violations or searching for violations of the standard model. Um, so yes, they can be used to study uh, uh, neutrinos, but we can adjust the running parameters such that we know whether or not we're sensitive to neutrinos uh, of a particular energy. Yeah. Maybe that was a bigger. Did I answer what you were asking? No, that was good. Yeah. Thank you. Um, when you look at the, when you look at the background radiation from the Big Bang, you can tell uh, that uh, there are regions that are more dense that couldn't be that dense if all there was was atoms or neutrinos. They would be moving relativistically at those very early times. But nevertheless, something was clumping that is moving very slowly and, uh, and, and serving as gravitational wells for the hot, ordinary matter that was around. So there is a definite clumpiness to dark matter for the universe as a whole and also locally. Nearly every single galaxy that we've observed uh, has dark matter in it. Not every single one, but nearly every single one has dark matter in it. Um, and uh, uh, the, this dark matter, you know, essentially wherever you see ordinary matter, almost everywhere, there is uh, dark matter around it. A am I getting at what you were wondering? Sure. Would, there, would there be a way to uh, determine where dark matter is more dense and then look for effects of that on the physical universe to determine more characteristics about it? Um, well, we're. There, there, I mean, there is, it's more dense wherever you see ordinary stuff. Now, if you're talking about a special galaxy where it has an enormously high amount of dark matter to ordinary matter, I don't know that anybody has seen. Well, I guess my uh, question would be, would there be more dense, denseness of dark matter around the black hole at the center of our galaxy than around the edges? Um, You, can, you would not see the dark matter itself. You, you would see it revealed by how fast things are spinning around and how fast they trail off, the, the speeds trail off as you get further and further out. Um, uh, the, there is some disagreement about how clumpy the centers of galaxies are. And people are trying to understand that in terms of potential uh, distributions of dark matter within these systems. Uh, but that's still a pretty open, uh, open question. I don't know if there are any astronomers here who would like to add any more detail to that than I'm aware of. Are there any astronomers here? Yeah. Can, can you add to that? Um, I think so coming back to angular momentum, the question you asked, that there's lots of ideas about dark matter, as was sort of said. We don't really know. If we're looking at the center of our own galaxy, there's a lot of dust and gas that gets in the way. So it's really hard to study that environment. Um, it's hard to detect dark matter. If you were looking for clumpy dark matter, you tend to be looking for 
big scale structures and that's also challenging. You're looking at outskirts of galaxies that can be kind of faint. Um, it's just a very tough kind of thing to, to study and that's why I think one of the most promising things is looking for these direct detections because if we end up having to rely on like observations astronomically that gets really hard for these kind of effects and our instrumentation is not there yet. So we kind of do the easy things first and none of this is easy um, so we're doing the slightly easier things first and then kind of heading into those more complicated things. So sort of the, the joke in astronomy is anything that has the word dark on the front of it means we don't really understand it. So that's dark matter and dark energy answers on a postcard. Um, we, we don't really know. Um, it could be our entire understanding of how the universe works is wrong on this kind of thing. We, we don't know, so we just have to try, like was said, with the best ideas we can um, and see what we find and then rule things out and kind of converge on an answer from them. And if we don't find anything, then we look to the theorists to come up with good, other good ideas of how the universe works. You made a comment about one group of uh, investigators had uh, some hints or some uh, indication that there was, you said there was a, they were detecting them in a modulated way. I, I wasn't sure, did you mean it's, a, it's variable over time? Yes, it has to like do with... Over the year? It, yes, over the period of a year. Yeah. So um, uh, interactions... Uh, depend on many things, many characteristics, but they also depend on the speed with which a particle is approaching another particle. And at some times of the year, the Earth in its orbit around the Sun is moving into the wind of dark matter, and sometimes it's moving with the wind of dark matter. And so the amounts of energy available for the collision, and thus the likelihood of a collision can be affected by that. And that's called the, uh, a mo an annual modulation effect in the rate of events. And so they've seen, uh, they've seen an annual modulation of hits in their experiment. Now their experiment is not very um, good at seeing uh, individual events and saying, yes, that's due to dark matter. There is a, there is a large signal that's from ordinary stuff, and on top of that, there's a modulation. And it, it does seem to have something similar to the annual, annual modulation effect that one would expect from such a thing. Is there any notion that there's a current, that there's an actual flow in the dark matter itself? Um, we, have, we, have not, we have not seen evidence of these flows. Uh, uh, the, uh, you, you said, so, so it was the Earth moved and moved into the wind and with the wind, but... Uh, the wind meaning that uh, everything is co-orbiting the center of mass of the Milky Way galaxy. So you can imagine that, you know, stuff that's falling in might, you know, you might be moving into that. Or you're, if you're moving towards the center, then you're moving with it. And so this, uh, the dark matter is moving coincident or coherently with the same direction of movement of the... It's just orbiting via gravity yes. and independently of the ordinary matter around it. So not Except but gravitationally. Sorry, I didn't mean to step on your question. No, that's okay. So the, so the movement of these things would be kind of like movements of the stars in a, in a cluster where they're sort of just, they're all in the same co-orbiting a common center of mass, but, um, but they're not influencing each other except through their mutual gravitation. Yeah, not a coherent uh, current, okay. Yeah, Very it's not like there's a friction. You, okay, I understand now. Good. Thank you. Yeah. All right, well, I don't yes. oh. one last question. Yeah, I, I Earlier when you talked about weakly interacting, and you go back in the context when the, you talk about just after the Big Bang, you know, when the universe is hotter and denser, and you had electroweak force, and you've got this matter and, and dark matter in equilibrium. Now, as it cools off and expands, the electromagnetic and weak have split apart. That happened a lot earlier than that. Okay, that, so, but why, why are they suspecting weak interaction, though? That's what I'm trying to. 
we right. know no, we know that it is at most weakly interacting. Otherwise, we would have seen it. There are some coincidences uh, uh, in the, uh, um, uh, the 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 time when these when this kind of decoupling would have taken place, which would be consistent with a weakly interacting particle. But it is we don't know that it's weakly interacting. It could be a particle that only interacts via gravity. All we know is that it is at most weakly interacting. And we have some attempts to understand things like uh, why gravity is so much weaker than the other forces that suggest a type of particle which would be weakly interacting. So if that approach is correct, that suggests the existence of weakly interacting particles that would be very dark matter-like. But it's, so it's, but we don't know it's still highly speculative. speculative is what you're... It's speculative. We're, we're going after, yeah, as John was saying, the, the easier guesses first, easier being a relative term, and the more what I would call natural types of guesses, because you know, it's, it's nice that one area of physics and astronomy suggests an answer to a completely different area you know, or a completely different problem from a, a different type of measurement. But that doesn't mean it's right. Could be the other people are right, or could be we're all somewhat right, or we're all wrong. We, we don't know the answer to that. Th that may be more than what you asked, but did I answer what you asked? Yeah. All right, well, let's thank uh, Elon for the talk. And I think he'd be willing to stay after and ask more, uh, answer more questions. And let me just remind you of two upcoming events. I'm going to steal oh, your sure. computer. Let's see. December 6th at 6.30, that's the next Universe Reveal talk. This is on, um, so thinking about how neurobiology contributes to thinking about how we deal with stress and resilience. On December 2nd, um, at, uh, this is on the University of Notre Dame uh, campus, so Jordan Ellenberg um, talking about giving the uh, Christmas lecture. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for coming out this evening and hope you'll come back. Thanks. Thank you.